guys. This is um, myofacial trigger point injection. It's a very simple lecture, very quick lecture. And um, at the end of the lecture, I'm, what's up, Hector? No, just the best time. Ah. At the end of the lecture, if you want, we can do one quick short exam of showing you how to do a shoulder exam, you know, because it's pretty quick. So myofascial pain, as you know, it's a, is basically muscular pain issues. It's spasms. It's reproducible. The key that it's reproducible. It occurs in a lot more in females, and it can be anywhere in your in the body. Okay. And it's basically do not confuse myofascial pain syndrome, even though they overlap with fibromyalgia. When there is a myofascial pain um, syndrome, and it's classified as myositis and myalgia, it has the same code and, and as fibromyalgia. It could, but the thing is, they don't. They're not the same type of patients, even though some of the things do overlap. They're easier to treat. So basically, trigger point is a hyper irritable spot in the skeletal muscle that is associated with n palpable nodules, what we call taunt bands. The, prior to the changes that the insurances have made, the diagnosis was in order to do a trigger point injection was that you had to call it a taunt band. But now things have changed, so it's not the same thing that you can use. What the, it's the big, basic thing with the taunt band and what the difference in a real, true trigger. We do a lot of trigger point injections, but a true trigger is that when you press on it, you'll feel it. It will reproduce a radicular type of radiation type of thing. And you'll feel the snapping of it, okay? You'll feel it under your fingers. Now, the best way to feel it is that you take a little bit of an alcohol, you wipe the area, and it's slightly wet, and you pass your finger through it, and you'll feel the thing. When you press on it, you will have a reproducible pain that will spread. That's a true trigger. We see a lot of trigger muscle spasms, and we call them triggers. But the true trigger is is really a tight band, a nodule that you will feel that's poppable and it will re cause a referable pain, almost like if it's like a radiculopathy. So if you have a pain that's on the, the superior part of the trap, you press on it and a pain shoots down the arm, that's a true trigger point in uh, poppable nodule and that's a true trigger that you can really inject. It will give you like a um, ridicular kind of symptoms. There is a short active trigger point and there's a latent trigger point. What a latent trigger point is, it does not produce an immediate pain. It develops a nodule intermuscular. It is in a more deeper muscle area. What it causes is decrease in range. It will inhibit the range of movement or the range of those, the area and that's that's another type of a trigger point, but it's more deep in the muscle layers. Okay. So the pathophysiology, as we know, it could be nociceptive, central sensitization, uh, sensitization. They have the whole gambit with the points of neural hyperactivity, dense collection of nociceptors, and they can have a whole cascade of triggers that end up causing that little contraction of the muscle to lead to a nodule formation and the irritation can be found anywhere in the body. You can have tender points in any of the body. So that's why it's trigger point in, uh, points with myofascial syndrome is very much confused with also fibromyalgia. So basically you have a trauma, you have an inflammation, you have a damage, you end up with sensitization of the alpha delta and the C fibers, which will then lead to a persistence of an impulse, 
that will slow be onset to a persistent ill-defined ache. It's a big cascade that leads to a constant pain with a trigger. The importance of knowing the alpha, delta, and the C impulse, and knowing the spinal reticulum pathway to the limbic and to the frontal lobe, etc., is for your board exam. Okay, those are board questions right there. It's you're never going to really need to know about any of that, but you have to know the alpha is the sharp first pain, then the alpha, uh, then the C impulse is the one that travels the spinal reticulum pathway. These are board questions that come up. So what happens, it's basically the damage occurs in the sacroplasmic reticulum and the release of calcium ions and the formation of the contraction occurs. Then this contraction, what's important, is sustained. So if the contraction sustains, how I explain it to the patients that the muscle irritation causes a muscle contraction, and then the muscle forgets to relax. It just maintains it. And, and that becomes more and more a buildup and into the sensitivity of what we feel as a nodule taunt band. So several factors that predispose some people to having more trigger ports than other people could be many etiologies. It could be from anemias. It could be from vitamin deficiency, leg length discrepancies. It could be from an abnormal stresses. It could be from the way that they carry their bags on one shoulder uh, versus spreading it out equally. It could be multiple reasons. It could be from even hypothyroidism can predispose people into having more trigger point inject, uh, trigger point um, points throughout their body than other people. Poor posture. It's mechanics. In in uh, in rehab, we talk about mechanics. What they say in rehab is that the most, the least painful, and the uh, posture that you can maintain is an erect, straight posture where there is no deformity. As soon as you deviate from a normal erect posture where there is least amount of pain, you start to develop pain symptoms. Rounded shoulders, leaning forward, what happens? Everything in the body has to compensate for it. So poor posture and poor stance can cause you to have more muscle spasms, more contractions, and to have more pain in overall general, whether it's top bands or whether it's General leg leg discrepancy. How does that happen? Now I have a high heel, and then now I'm going to walk like this. Okay. If I walk like this, what does the muscles have to do? They have to compensate for the difference. So by compensating for the difference, how do they do that? It's either by contraction, and that contraction causes in certain areas. Some people are more predisposed than others, and starts to form nodules throughout the body. It's just. General, I always tell patients, it's mechanics. You throw one thing off, it's mechanics. Something else has to compensate. So basically, we went through all of this. What's important is that there is no atrophy. There is no notable muscle weakness. That's the key in a trigger point. You're not looking for at a neurological deficit. There is no neurological deficit, no atrophy, no notable muscle weakness. That's the biggest key in this thing, so that it can rule out something like a root compression, a wrist, something severe that needs an immediate medical or surgical assessment. Basically, the diagnosis, as we've went through, the taunt pan is a microscopic contraction, not at the end plane zone, which results in excessive release of acetylcholine at the abnormal end plates. You can do it as confirmatory observation with visual, tactile, or you can do with, uh, with the pain that can be reduced. What's important is that they found that in, in the skin resistance to electrical current has been slightly lowered with the active trigger points that are found there by EM, spontaneous EMG studies. This is important so they have been able to reproduce and diagnose trigger points or taunt bands uh, with EMG studies. Now, are you going to do that to every patient? No. But they have done the studies and they can find that there is true trigger point and the reason for the EMG changes. The only thing that you need to take out of from this, 
for your boards is know that spontaneous EMGs with trigger points show spike positives and low amplitude. That's the only two, three words that you need to know. That's for the, and on the, the pain boards, they do ask about EMGs. Silent. No, nothing. That's just the EMGs, then this just is a change. EMG findings, you can have positive sharp waves, you can have a, um, um, negative or, or the reverse amplitudes when there's an abnormality. The thing with the EMG is they always try to figure out whether it's radicalopathy versus <coughs> neuropathy versus myopathy versus whether it's a trigger point. That's where the changes you have to look. So that's a, the amplitude is important because that will differentiate from the radicalopathy. If it's normal, no changes, it's not going to be anything. You're not going to find any of those findings. The treatments, non-pharmacological, so postural changes, you send them to physical therapy, you do massage, TENS, uh, acupuncture, you can do even electrotherapy, e stems, you know, all of this stuff, magnetic therapy, and then you have your spray and stretch, you can do thermotherapy, strengthening of the muscles, improving your mechanics, then you can even try pharmacological, the NSAIDs, the muscle relaxants, all depending on what the under treat, under cause, the cause for these trigger points is really what the treatments you would choose. But the best one is the, what I like the best is the trigger point injections. Now the difference between dry needling, needling injecting with steroids, without steroids, just locals, and Botox is a whole nother story. But in the trigger point injections, they have done studies where they found that there was no difference between dry needling or injecting with local. The only difference is between dry needling and local is that after the injection, there is a severe amount of irritation and pain caused on the patient. If you do it with a local, you'd reduce that. It's for the comfort of the patient, but there is technically, in the many studies, which I have it toward the end, there is no difference between dry needling or injecting with medications through a true trigger. So how do you do it? As I said, you, with this alcohol swab, you wipe the area so it's moist. Then you go through with your finger and you feel the knot. Once you feel the knot, you go one finger, next finger, you squeeze right there, and that's and you put in the needle, not a direct 90 degree angle, but a slight angle. Mm -hmm. And you go in and you go out. You have to be careful depending on what area you're on. If you're on up here in the upper traps, in this area, you have to make sure you're not using a two inch size needle. This patient is thin and you're going down and hitting the apex and causing a little or you're right here, a thin person, and then you're going in right through the intercostals, and again, causing the effects. What's important is that you feel the skin, okay? You feel the skin, and you make a little pinch. That little pinch, and then you go through. As you're going through, a true trigger will give you a feeling of a sandy, grindy sensation. That's when you know you're really going through a true trigger. A smooth in and out is a smooth in and out. And if that's what you get, just give a little bit of local, and that's about it. So, as we went through this, they've done many things with local, etc. And in Europe, some people inject, instead of the local, they inject with Voltron. Some, uh, like Toradol you know, in Europe, a little bit of steroid. I'm not in favor of doing steroids in the trigger point injection um, at all. If I do it, I just do it with plain local. Um, but I can see the logic of using a Toradol or any kind of an anti-inflammatory. That might make logic. I don't, I haven't used it, but in Europe they do use it a lot. Again, we went through all of that. It's the, of the dry needling and then 
the pathophysiology of how dry kneeling versus if with without the impulses. I'm not going to go through that. The study that implicates that the efficacy between dry kneeling versus with medication um, that it really doesn't make a difference. This is another study showing the same concept. More studies. Basically, we're done. <laughs>